When it comes to compact Japanese sports sedans, the Lexus IS is the OG. This is a nameplate that was introduced back in 2001, and at the time, this vehicle was proof that Lexus could build a sedan that wasn't a boring isolation chamber on wheels like so many other models before it. Now today, obviously, the sports sedan segment has changed, and so many buyers are now gravitating toward SUVs. However, today, I'm actually out here in Phoenix, Arizona to drive a very special model that takes me back to my childhood, because this right here is a 2000 2003 Lexus IS300 Sport design with the incredibly rare five-speed manual transmission. And I actually had a chance to borrow this vehicle from my good friend Tyson Hughey. You'll see him later on in the video. And like I said earlier, I really wanted these back in middle school. So today we're gonna take the IS300 Sport design out for a drive and we're gonna find out, does this vehicle still represent one of the best driving Japanese sports sedans you can buy? Stay tuned to find out. So obviously it's not every day that I get to show you guys an incredibly rare car like this. In fact, in the used car market, it's, it's becoming incredibly difficult to even find a vehicle in this good a condition. So from behind the camera is actually my good friend, Tyson Hughey. Say hey, Tyson. Hey, everybody. So Tyson actually just picked up this car. When did you just pick up this car? Like uh, December, early December, okay. so a couple months ago. Okay, and I have to tell you, Tyson, you did really well because <laughs> uh, this thing looks so clean. I mean, I was trying to look for a vehicle like this online and I just couldn't find one with, that even had a stick shift. Uh, and you picked one up, of course, so yeah. it looks it looks fantastic. I'll chalk it up to really good care of ownership by the prior owner. So this car, as you mentioned, is exceedingly rare. However, the community for these is devout. And so when my brother sent me a link to the listing, I could tell within the first couple pictures, it was a really good example. Yeah, absolutely. And the color you said is called Thundercloud Metallic, correct? Thundercloud. And this was a sport design specific color. So you could in fact only get it on this oh. uh, particular trim level. I did not know that this was exclusive to the sport design trim. And I believe back in the day, the sport design trim was like 1400 bucks extra. Something uh, like that. Yeah, I'll have to reference the sticker on that, but it was largely a color cosmetics package. I mean, you had things like your gloss black uh, badging accents, the wheel, 11 spoke wheels and things like that. But um, for the most part, mechanically, it was pretty much the same as the other IS 300 models. Okay. Well, let me trade cameras with sure. you, uh, Tyson, because I want you to kind of take us around <laughs> the front of this vehicle here. Yeah. I'll let you host for a second. Yeah, hey. <laughs> so, it's been a while since I've done Redline. I know it has been a while, but it's it's great to have you back on the channel. Appreciate so let's it. go ahead and talk about the front end with this car, Tyson. It's yeah. completely stock, correct? For sure. Yeah. This car is pretty much as it left the factory. Um, I pulled the front plate off it. Arizona doesn't issue front pl front tags, but... One thing that really struck me when the car arrived is just the proportions. It's very compact by today's standards. The car has an incredibly tight turning radius because it's rear wheel drive and it is sort of size wise so much smaller than a lot of what's on the road today. Um, one of my favorite things and kind of like Sofian, I love these cars when they came out because of the contrast in the HID headlights and the yellow fogs. It's such a cool look at night and it really kind of differentiated this car when it came out. Yeah, the fact that it has HIDs also is impressive because I feel like back in the day, if you were looking at a German car, they had halogens. You had to tick an option box to get the HIDs. Yeah. And I also love the fact that it comes with yellow fogs from the factory. Yeah. It's so JDM. It is cool. And, <laughs> you know, we'll get into maybe the nuts and bolts later, but this car was only 32 grand, which we did the inflation calculator just before taping here, and it was comes out to like 40, 54 or something. So, Which is the same price as a new IS, right. honestly, right. which is kind of just crazy how much inflation has like, yeah. really, <laughs> really engulfed the price. Well, I'm going to have you open the hood, yep. Tyson, actually, um, and I'll, we'll trade cameras so I can we can talk about what makes this vehicle... You super, got it. Super special. But I have to say, man, this thing for a 22 year old car, it is in such good condition. Whoops, that was my fault. I oh, no worries. <laughs> town, so. So, yeah, so um, under the hood of the IS, and this vehicle was only available with one engine here in the US. That's why they call it an IS 300. This is back in the day, Tyson, where the 300 actually meant something. Yeah, three <laughs> liter inline six. Yep, a three liter 2JZ GE. Correct. I believe that was the engine yep. number. Uh, three liter um, inline six. Variable valve timing, no direct injection, no turbos, port injection. It's a, it's the, the legendary engine basically from the Toyota Supra minus the two turbos. The fact that makes this car so special is yours it has a five-speed manual transmission, which they didn't offer until 2002, and it was offered until 2005. This one also has the optional limited slip differential for like 390 bucks. So again, this is rear wheel drive with a limited slip diff. I think fuel economy is rated at around 16, 23. So not the best gas mileage. Right. Uh, it does require premium though, correct? Yeah, 
Okay. It does. So premium fuel, it has like an 18 or 17 and a half gallon fuel tank. What are you doing in the range on this thing? I honestly have only put a couple hundred miles on it, okay. so I haven't even gone to that point yet. But um, you know, for me, it's it's not even necessarily about the economy aspect of it. I just think it's a fun to drive car. And I've even seen people online call this sort of like a, a Japanese three series from the time, you know, mm -hmm. because of the proportions, because of the drivetrain and the rear wheel drive dynamics, it really is almost German in nature. Yeah, I mean, that's, you're exactly right. Lexus built this car because they were like, we're tired of the three series having all the glory in this segment. So we're going to show people that we can build a three series competitor. But of course, it's going to be reliable because it's got that Toyota and Lexus, you know, build quality. Now, um, in terms of performance, I remember Lexus quoted a zero to 60 of like around 6.8 seconds back in the day, which honestly was pretty quick. Um, but 215 horsepower, 218 pound feet of torque. Obviously, there was a twin turbo version, the Super that made like 320 horsepower. And in the GS 300, this actually made 220 horsepower. Power. Uh, I think Lexus said that the compactness of the engine bay required it to have a different exhaust and intake manifold, which is why it has a little bit less power. But still, that power figure was pretty good back in the day because back then we had BMW 330i's, which had like 225 horsepower. But, and Tyson, you probably know this, the TL that came out in 04, that had 270 horsepower. So, cool. But let's go ahead and move around the side profile because yep. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, first of all, the condition of it. Look at the paint, the way the paint still shines. It's, it's amazing, especially out in this bright Arizona sun. But the cool thing about the IS is it's a very small car. Um, and you really notice that when you're looking at the rest of the profile because uh, at 176.7 inches long, this is basically a subcompact car in dimensions. I mean, the current IS is around eight inches, eight to 10 inches longer than this vehicle. It has a 105.1 inch long wheelbase. And also look at these wheels, Tyson. Uh, you said these are like a silver design, but in the later years, you got a gray, a graphite gray design. Yeah, like from the little bit of research that I did, um, Lexus had some documentation that talked about how the wheel uh, sort of color scheme was changed to be just slightly darker in subsequent sport design years. And you can see the badge here. Yes, that the fact that it has the badge there is great. I mean, look, paint still has this metallic fleck in it. Uh, you have actually a really skinny tire by modern car stands, like a 215, yeah. which is like the same size tire they put on like a Toyota GR86. Pretty wild. <laughs> which is crazy to think, but I mean, all independent double wishbone suspension. This thing was set up to be a driver's car. Uh, and we'll talk about that later on when we get out into the road. I also love the fact that the window trim here is kind of blacked out. You have a sunroof, which I believe was standard back in the day. Right. Um, which is just a standard sunroof. But again, look at how the paint still shines. And the fact that you also picked this car up from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever had it before you, they did a fantastic yeah. job. Luckily, the car only <laughs> spent about a year in Illinois. And up until that point, it was 100% Southern California. But the, the records on it were extensive. So dealer maintenance from new. Really, it was kind of a no-brainer when I saw all the um, sort of supporting documents that came with the car. I knew it was a good one. Yeah, so I, also I love uh, I love the, the plate that you've chosen from the back, <laughs> 2J, which is yeah. obviously giving an homage to the engine code. Correct, two and, and I have to give a quick shout out. I can't take credit for that. <laughs> uh, my brother in Utah has his own YouTube channel under the 2J name and his IS300 is heavily modified. It's a six speed manual, twin turbo, thousand horsepower. So he would, needless to say, blow my doors off uh, <laughs> in any kind of drag race. But the fact that this is completely stock and it's this clean makes this car, in my, in my eyes, very cool as well. Um, so I think the spoiler, was that, in, no, that was optional. It was on, according to the window sticker, that was an add-on. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, like you called out earlier, the LSD, the sport design package, and other than that, kind of for 32 grand, what you see is what you get. This yeah. literally started a trend because everyone either called it uh, Alteza taillights or it was either like Lexus taillights, but everyone started kind of copying this kind of clear lens look with the red uh, behind it where it would kind of show red whenever you hit the brakes. Of course, this shows red all the time. Uh, I also love the kind of blacked out badging that you get with the sport design. And that exhaust tip, that's the stock exhaust, but yeah. it actually almost looks like an aftermarket <laughs> exhaust, <true. laughs> which I think yeah, is fan sport fantastic. Exhaust. But let me open the trunk really quick because I want to show people uh, the size of the trunk. Now, there's no obviously a release on the outside. There's a little keyhole there, but you can also just pull the lever on the inside. Obviously, you can see Tyson has his little Moto Compacto in here. My Moto Compacto Type S, guys. <laughs> That's an easy plus five horsepower. <laughs> Absolutely. But you can see the trunk, I believe, measured around 10 and a half cubic feet, which is pretty small by modern car standards. But what's interesting, Tyson, is the trunk is the same size on the new IS. Really? Yeah, it's around 10.8 cubic feet. So the IS has always kind of had a smaller trunk by the numbers, but I still think it's a pretty usable trunk. There are hinges that crush your cargo there. Uh, it looks like there's a sub back there that doesn't allow you to 
fold the seat down or something. Yeah, trunk storage extension. I haven't really looked too okay, much into so that. Okay, so it looks like it has a pass-through. Right, probably for skis um, instead. But that's interesting because back in this era, a lot of cars didn't actually have the ability to fold down the trunk. They just had a pass-through, but they've kind of been doing away with that. A lot of modern sports sedans now do give you the ability to fold down the cargo area, but obviously this is a sedan. Remember, there was a wagon available, but it's not as cool because you couldn't get it with a stick. So moving on to the inside of this 2003 IS300 Sport Design. Man, this thing really is a time time warp because uh, I seriously thought this interior back in the day was an amazing looking interior. I have to say, um, Tyson, you've kept, this thing that you picked up is in really good shape. Yeah, I mean, aside from some obvious uh, cosmetic <laughs> flaws that we'll get into, um, for 22 years old, it's not too bad. Yeah, so here's the key fob for the vehicle. Obviously, no push button start back there, but look at this key, guys. It looks brand new. It has your buttons here for panic, lock, unlock, even a power or a remote trunk release from the fob, which is fantastic. So you have to stick the key in the ignition and listen to that old Toyota chime, Tyson. I do. <laughs> <laughs> that brings me back Blast from the past. I know, right? That oh. characteristic starter. I know that sound that this car makes. It just, it, it just. Every Toyota sounds like this, except for the new stuff. The new stuff doesn't really sound like this anymore, but. Oh. Tyson, I may have to consider buying this from you. When Do you want to drive it home instead of uh, flying back? <laughs> instead of flying back to, to Pennsylvania, but. There you go. Uh, but anyways, let's go ahead and talk about some of the you know design characteristics in here. So yeah, hop inside, we'll, we'll take a look. So first of all, getting inside this vehicle, you really get a sense of how small the car is because you kind of look over the, the hood super easily. The dash is also really short. There's not really much in terms of like things that are getting in your way for visibility. You also have this really slim A-pillar and this car even had side curtain airbags back in the day. Uh, looking at the rest of the interior here, you can see there is some suede Alcantara on the door. You have one touch up down for the driver window. The other windows are not one touch, but that's okay. The switch gear in here really reminds me of that old Toyota, old Lexus. The steering wheel you can see is just a manual tilt. There's no telescoping. Although for me, the driving position seems fine. I also, this steering wheel reminds me of a Toyota Celica. <laughs> that's kind of what, <laughs> what it looks like. And then you have the old cruise control stock. What's funny, Tyson, is Toyota still uses this wow. cruise control stock in like a Lexus GX 460. You can still find that there in like a Toyota 4. Hey, if it ain't broke. <laughs> if it ain't broke, there you go. don't fix it, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then also the gauge cluster. So this gauge cluster was very controversial when it first came out because it looks very timeless. It looks great now. It's a chronograph style watch. It also lights up as orange when you have it lit up at night. Some people have complained that it's difficult to read. Do you think it's difficult to read at a glance? No, I mean, the, if anything, the um, coolant temperature gauge is a little small. Yes, I but see that there. But honestly, uh, it's... It's well laid out. Okay. And then um, there was an optional navigation. This one doesn't have it, which I think I prefer anyways. It had like a screen that was motorized and would pop up. And I think in 04, uh, if you didn't get nav, they added like a storage compartment here, if I remember correctly. And then yours, there's a little bit of this kind of like sticky dash. Is that what you called it? Yeah. So evidently from 2002 to 05, whatever material they were using here and along the side of the center stack were subject to sort of blemishes if you touched it. So. A lot of people go uh, with solutions like painting this over or mm -hmm. uh, other, you know, swapping it out, whatever you can do, but it's just yeah. cosmetic. It's really, it's almost like, it's almost like it's melting in the, mm -hmm. in the sun is what it feels like. But I mean, for, for a car that's 22 years old and this is really the only imperfection is fantastic. You have single zone climate control, lots of buttons. There's a sea of buttons here. And then look at that. Cassette player, cassette player. <laughs> with and a six, a six disc. disc in dash. Yeah, <laughs> those were the days. You can't even find either of those in a lot of new cars anymore. You have volume knob. You actually have heated seats, although one level heated seats. Look, this thing even had a snow mode. I did not expect there you that. Go. Um, ashtray over there, of course. A little bit of storage here. Don't expect to find like a wireless phone charging pad. No Android Auto or CarPlay. No Bluetooth even. I don't think. Um, but you, this car does have the Lexus premium and sound system. This is before Lexus went with Mark Levinson. But the one thing that we talked about earlier, Tyson, is for a Lexus, this interior doesn't feel super luxurious, and that was on purpose because Lexus wanted this car to be more about the driving dynamics and the driving feel. So, personally, I actually think that it's a, fr a really nice interior still. Does it have all the wood trim? No, but I kind of don't miss it. What about you? Yeah, same. I mean, this was a big shift for Lexus. If you if you keep in mind that up until this point, they were catering to a different de demographic entirely. So, some of the commercials and advertisements for this car um, shifted to a younger buyer and right. they had a lot of fun energetic type um, you know promotional activities and that spoke to Lexus's attempt to move in on this market segment. Right, and then also we can't ignore this, that cue ball <laughs> like shift, shift yes. knob, which is the same as you'll find on the automatic transmission. Yep. I must say, this probably gets hot. 
when it gets hot. Yeah, I mean, it's not summertime yet here, no. but I can imagine that would be pretty scorching. Yeah, and like this transmission is a five speed. Lexus did offer a six speed manual in other markets with the IS200, but that six speed could not handle the torque of this engine. And that's why they had to go with a five speed, which is kind of like a modified Toyota truck engine or transmission. The throws are a little bit rubbery in there. It doesn't really go into the gates with super with a lot of pre precision, but once you get used to it, I think it's perfectly fine. Um, cup holders, really tiny <laughs> cup yeah, holders that are kind of like, like for your Coke can. Uh, that's yeah, about ex it. exactly. Now we've got these massive cup holders for these big 32 ounce, you know, big gulps. Go big gulps. You have <laughs> a nice padded center console armrest here, and you can see my phone doesn't even fit in there. But there's a little bit of storage over there. So storage is definitely lacking in this car. But I mean, what do you expect? This is yeah. this is all about driving. And I showed him <laughs> earlier one of the things about the upholstery is for sport design. You had yes. this piping, so this around the perimeter here and then the inserts here instead of being the um, suede or alcantara fabric these are perforated leather on the inside yeah i definitely prefer the perforated leather as opposed to the suede so thanks for reminding me of that but let's go ahead and show me so let's show them the back seat because i want to show just how little space this car did have even back in the day so um the wheelbase is pretty short, 105 inches long, but Lexus said that you have you had around 30 inches of legroom back here, which this is basically where I'd have the seat to drive. 30 inches is small. I mean, you could get a Toyota Corolla nowadays and has five more inches of legroom. The new IS has around 35 inches of legroom as well, but you can see for somebody my height, I'm not quite as tall. I'm not the tallest person, so there's a big drive uh, tunnel hump here for the middle passenger. You have you know storage compartment or little seat back pockets here. There's also another ashtray. And look at that, there's teeny tiny cup holders there too. <laughs> but no heated rear seats, no rear seat air vents. Don't expect to find any of that. You can see there's an armrest here that folded down and, and then they even carried over some of the piping, uh, the contrasting piping back here, along with the full perforation for the leather. So, I mean, obviously, headroom space is decent, although the sunroof takes up some space here. But I mean, overall, you could still put average size adults back yeah. here. Um, but I think I think for the segment it had a, a pretty decent backseat. Yep. All right. So the moment you guys have been waiting for, I've got Tyson, of course, riding shotgun with me, and we are finally going to get behind the wheel of an IS three hundred. And I'm going to admit to you guys first, uh, I've never driven an IS three hundred with a stick. Well, I guess I drove it over here earlier, but I've never actually driven a manual one for the channel. I drove I drove one like. 15 years ago, maybe, <laughs> when I worked at the Ford dealership, uh, that was an automatic. Um, so this is uh, a really special treat, Tyson. So hey, <laughs> glad if I'm honored. Yeah, no, if thank you for the, <laughs> this, because uh, uh, I've always wanted one of these vehicles, and I've never gotten a chance to drive one with a manual. And this thing has 118,485 miles on the original clutch, I think, right? Yeah, I do believe it's original clutch. The car came with a stack of records, including a timing belt change not too long ago. So okay. that's kind of the big ticket item on some of these Japanese cars. Mm -hmm. um, but mechanically, I mean, it still feels tight and pretty seamless. So. Um, I don't anticipate this thing would slow down anything before <laughs> 250,000 miles. No, I mean, it's a, it's a Lexus, it's a Toyota. It's, you could easily drive this thing 300,000 miles, I'm sure. I don't know if the clutch could last that long, but it's definitely, uh, this thing feels tight still. It, yeah. feels, it still feels really solid. Um, the steering, in fact, I love how it gives you so much feedback because <laughs> it's, a, it's a hydraulic power steering system. I'm so used to driving all these cars with uh, electric power steering systems. So this is a nice, uh, definitely a very nice treat. Yeah, and I was talking to my brother because obviously he's the one that kind of got me intrigued about these cars. That he said was his favorite sort of driving dynamic was not just the, the visibility and sort of cabin feel, but the steering wheel diameter is really small. It's got a thick rim um, border on it and a lot of good feedback from the road, which, you know, by today's standards, you know, this right, right here. Yep. Okay. Um, it's tougher to find cars that really put you in tune with the road. Oh, absolutely. And and I want to also talk about the visibility in here because like that sh really short hood, you can see so well out of this thing and you have these really slim pillars like it. It really shows you that a lot of the new cars are just stuffed with technology today and you just can't really see out of them as, as easily as you used to be able to. I mean, you get used to it, but but this is kind of a very refreshing change. I also love how low we sit. Like all these all these other cars, uh, everyone's going to SUVs nowadays and uh, I just, I appreciate sitting low in a sports sedan. Yeah, and I don't know if um, in terms of, you know, aftermarket support, there's probably a ton of stuff they make for these cars. So. And if anybody's into like the tuning community, this platform was 
<laughs> widely supported for that, which is part of also why I guess you can't find any good ones anymore because they were tinkered with too much. Oh yes, all the, uh, they were basically clapped out or riced out. That's what I've seen. And they even came with like um, the, the ricey looking taillights from the factory. Yeah, yeah take it away. exactly. <laughs> So immediately I'm noticing the uh, clutch in this car is definitely heavy um, and it engages right at the end of the travel, which takes some getting used to. So I apologize in advance if your head is bobbing when I'm, <laughs> when I'm going into no second gear. <laughs> but I have to say like... And it's gonna be a ride at the light. Oh yes, that's right. Um, even though this transmission doesn't have that snickety snick precision of Honda transmissions, there's still something very satisfying about this. Yeah, there you go. Get on it. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Oh, it sounds so good. <laughs> that engine does have a good note to it. And so, you know, you called the motor a legend, which I, thanks for that, because that's that's my buzzword. Yes. Um, I'm, a, I'm an Acura guy, and honestly, this was a bit of a stretch for me to, you know, take a tiny step outside of my realm. And I'm really glad that I did, because it just kind of goes to show you, a lot of people call the late 90s, early 2000s, sort of the golden era for Japanese cars. Mm -hmm. And I have to agree, because, this was a, you know, very solid built in Japan sports sedan that I think for the price was a good value. Oh yeah, I think I think it was a ton of value and it really does remind you just how good sports sedans were back in this era. I mean, back then you could find so many brands that offered a manual transmission and nowadays nothing. But yeah, that's a good point. So I talked about in my video on the car, there was a road and track up, uh, magazine issue back in the day where they did an 11, 11 car comparison. Eight of the 11 were stick shift so it kind of we kind of didn't know how good we had it back then as enthusiasts you know you could have your pick of just about any brand with a, a third pedal mm -hmm. and nowadays it's kind of a rarity mm, I, I think actually the last time that Lexus even offered a manual in the IS was the second generation they offered a manual in the IS 250 I don't know if you remember what the 250 mm -hmm. had it had a two and a half liter v6 that had actually less horsepower than this that was kind of known as like the least special IS uh, I always preferred the 300 this first gen over like the IS 250 in the second generation just because I think that they've aged incredibly well. It has the better engine. Uh, it has only five gears, but you know what? The five speed in this thing, I think it's geared pretty well toward, I mean, obviously I, I haven't had a chance to take it on the highway. Um, I'm assuming it probably revs pretty high. On the it highway. does rev a little on the high side, but again, that because the exhaust note is kind of muted, it's not overly obnoxious right. at highway speed. And the cabin fit and finish is really good. I mean, you know, again, for 119,000 miles, it shows the build quality that was present in, in this era. Yeah, and that's the thing, I wanna talk about the engine because it is really quiet. Like at, at highway speeds or just at cruising, you don't even hear it. You really have to like push the engine to actually like hear it. But when you do, oh. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty good, huh? Oh my God, that's, and it's so smooth. Like there's very little vibration coming through with through the pedals, through the steering wheel. I feel a little bit in the shifter, but that's okay because it's very mechanical. This car feels very analog and visceral. Right, and I talked about this at a recent uh, panel discussion for Barrett Jackson. I consider this car and similar cars of the era future collectibles just yes. because for all those same reasons in terms of the limited production, you know, lower take rate when they were new and it was a rare spec to begin with. So um, if you can find one, <laughs> scoop it up. If you can find yeah. one, that's the key. We'll word. take a right here. The yeah, hit it. Go for it. Oh, give it more than that. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the trash control I did for see. a second. It was actually cutting power a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Pretty fast. I mean, back in the day, Lexus said like just under seven seconds, zero to 60. The quickest time I think I saw was car and driver. They got like 6.8. I have my timing equipment, but I'm not going to test it today because this is your baby and I'm not going to do an aggressive clutch dump or kind of test it. But obviously, <laughs> you break it, you buy it. <laughs> but I mean, obviously you can still push the engine. It's just, if you're going to, you know, get the quickest zero to 60 time with a manual, you have to dump the clutch, yeah. which is not good for the clutch. I yeah. mean, this is the original clutch, but. Do you guys remember the commercials from Lexus where they stacked a pyramid of champagne glasses on the hood of an LS yes, 400? I remember that, that And then they revved the car on a dyno to who knows what speed. <laughs> that I see reflected here too. It's just, somebody clearly put this car through its paces. And obviously Japan got this car as the Alteza in 1998. So yes. in the three years past that, they had so much time to refine and perfect it that by the time we got it in the States, I think it was a pretty well engineered machine. Oh yeah, I think so too. And then honestly, the I see so many people who have these and they'll like put the badging for Toyota Altez on the back too, just because that name really means something to an enthusiast. But honestly, like just how well this car drives, even 22 years later, I'm shocked. 
I'm shocked at how fun it is to drive. It's not very fast, obviously, by modern car standards, but you know, it makes up for that because it's so smooth, it's so refined. It also rides really well too. Like I don't hear uh, any kind of crashes from the suspension or anything like that. It just has a really calm and controlled ride quality. So it kind of gives you that balance where you can still attack your favorite back road in this thing and you can still daily drive it. The seats are also still pretty comfortable as well. I like the fact that this seat doesn't have the Alcantara because Alcantara, it looks good when it's new, but it looks horrible after a few years. Um, but overall, I'm just I'm just super yeah. impressed, Tyson. The other thing too to keep in mind, and there's a huge community for these cars, mm. so um, that's one thing that I learned is if you ever have you know need for consultative advice on IS300 anything, there is a cult following for these, oh, yes. and for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> so with all these new cars that I get a chance to drive and everything becoming SUVs, it's not every day that I get to drive a used gem like this. And I have to tell you guys, this thing here seriously took me back to my middle school, high school days. Because when I was in high school, I used to want one of these cars so badly. The driving dynamics, even though this car is over 20 years old, is still incredibly sharp. I mean, the chassis of the vehicle feels good. It's a rear wheel drive platform. It's a lightweight sports sedan. It's got a five speed manual, which is good, although it's again, kind of showing its truck-based roots, but that engine, I mean, the 2JZ GE engine still is a legend in today's tuner world. And there are so many people out there, including Tyson's brother, <laughs> who has an IS300 that has the, the Supra engine swap on it that is basically a four-door Supra. I mean, this car is known as basically the four-door Supra minus the turbochargers, but there's just so much aftermarket support. It's what makes these IS300 still incredibly desirable. And even though they are incredibly desirable, they still also are very kind of fly under the radar. That's what Tyson had mentioned uh, earlier is you can basically still drive one of these things and nobody notices you. Uh, however, most enthusiasts are gonna kind of look at it and know that you have something special, especially if you got one with the manual transmission, because I think only, or Lexus at the time said that they were only accounting about 10 to 15% of production to actually be the manual transmission. Uh, and Tyson, again, has one of the very few that was produced. And I gotta tell you guys, if you're looking for a used vehicle, something that is mechanical, visceral, that's gonna also be reliable uh, down the road, but also still fun to drive, basically the original Japanese BMW, because Infiniti got that uh, crown basically back in 2003, but I think Lexus had it first back in 2000 when this car first came out. Uh, and it really just shows, because if you're trying to find one of these vehicles today, they're not cheap. In fact, Tyson, tell us how much you paid for this car. Uh, this was over 14K. Okay, so actually I think that's a great deal because <laughs> when I was looking online for a vehicle like this, they were ranging in price from $5,000 for a really clapped out one with like 200,000 miles to around 20 grand for like an IS300 Sport Cross with like 80,000 miles. So I think you paid a really fair price and the original price of this car, Tyson, tell us how much it was. About 32.5. 32.5, which equates to again, around 54,000 54, yep. in today's money. So it really shows you uh, just how strong value these cars were back in the day and also how well they held up their value. And it's kind of really an homage to Lexus. Lexus is a brand, builds incredibly reliable cars, uh, incredibly well-made cars, uh, and they also show, proved that they could build a fun car as well for a younger audience as opposed to all the you know older people that were <laughs> typically buying Lexuses before us. But anyways, I want to thank you guys for uh, watching this uh, really cool used video or used car video on this 2003 Lexus IS. I want to also thank Tyson for helping uh, to film the video and to also for lending us this car. Um, Tyson, if people want to find you, where can they find you? Anytime, my friend. <laughs> uh, social media at Tyson Hugie, same uh, name under YouTube. And uh, obviously I more gravitated toward the Honda and Acura scene, <laughs> but hey, this is uh, Japanese fun stuff. It's right in my wheelhouse. Yeah, I think uh, even though you are, you tend to be a Honda Acura guy, you did good. Yeah. You, did, you did very good with this car. Call Stamp me. Of approval. Call me when you're ready to sell this thing because I, wa I want it. But anyways, guys, if you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews. Like us on Facebook. And as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.